Welcome everyone to our ECG webinar. Sorry for the delay, I think we're one minute late. Uh, I hope that this uh, is working. I see that people are slowly joining um, and uh, maybe you could already tell us if you can hear me okay. Uh, there's a chat and there's a, a Q&A section. So maybe in the chat. Yeah, okay. Can hear you, can hear you, sounds okay. Awesome, nice. So um, I would like to, to introduce myself real quick. Uh, my name is Franz Wiesbo. I'm the founder of MedMastery. I'm a cardiologist myself. Um, have lots of experience with ECG education, have written uh, ECG books, uh, created online courses, pretty much started MedMastery uh, as an ECG training platform. And now we've extended to lots of other courses. And I would like to introduce you um, to Andrew Horton. I'm joined by Andrew Horton. Hi, Andrew. Hey, friends. Good to see you. Uh, Andrew is a long uh, time teacher at MedMastery. He's super experienced, has written many ECG books, has taught uh, at, on Met Mastery, the, the ECG on Met Mastery, but also lots of other uh, areas. I think uh, your background is, is very diverse, uh, imaging, cardiac imaging background, but also ECG. Uh, so, and Andrew will be the teacher of this uh, webinar. And then I'm also joined by Dr. Edward Lipset. Um, he, from Med School Coach, uh, today's webinar is uh, presented in collaboration with our friends from Med School Coach. And hi, Ed, how's it going? Hi, w welcome to everyone. Uh, so Med School Coach is, maybe you can say real quick what Med School Coach is doing because some might not know what you guys are up to. Sure, yeah, a little bit about my background. I'm a diagnostic radiologist. I'm associate director of advising at Med School Coach, and Med School Coach, you know, the the um, the process of gaining entry into medical school is uh, a little convoluted and a little complicated. And so, Med School Coach is really devoted to helping uh, those individuals who want to pursue a medical career uh, gain acceptance into medical school. Awesome! Thank you very much for that quick introduction, and maybe some housekeeping. This is going to be a case-based webinar. We'll ha we have lots of, of great cases for you and polls. So it's, it's gonna be very interactive and we would like to actually get your questions. Uh, so we wanna actually uh, start a discussion. Um, so it's a two-way street uh, and works best if you guys join in on the discussion. So I would say, uh, please, uh, Ask your questions primarily in the Q&A section. There's a, there's a chat uh, section and a Q&A section that makes it a little confusing. So maybe uh, tend to ask the questions in the Q&A section. And so we're going to screen those questions and I'm gonna hand them over to Andrew as they come up or as I see fit. Um, and um, yeah, other than that, we have helpers who join us uh, in the background, you can't see them now, but should there be any technical difficulties, uh, they might come in and you might hear uh, a female voice uh, uh, joining us. Um, that, that will be our helpers uh, today, uh, Melanie and Alexi. And uh, yeah, so I think it's, we're all set and uh, we are ready to rock and roll. Andrew, do you wanna? Get started. Thank you, friends. And thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar this evening. So I'm going to be talking about ECG basics for future ECG rock stars. And we've been using electrocardiograms in one way or another for over a century now. And they remain one of the most useful and versatile of investigations that we have. They're easy to perform in just about any setting. They're relatively inexpensive and they can reveal a large amount of diagnostic information as we're going to see over the next hour. The technology for recording ECGs has changed beyond recognition over the last century, but the fundamentals of ECG interpretation have barely altered. So in this webinar, I'm going to cover the basic principles of how to approach an ECG with lots of case examples to illustrate what we're talking about. 
So before we begin to look at some ECGs, let's have a quick reminder of some basic electrophysiology and terminology. So we have a schematic diagram of the heart's electrical system here. Let's bring up the labels. So just to remind everybody, the electrical impulses in the heart with each heartbeat uh, are generated by the sinoatrial node normally. The sinoatrial node depolarizes and then depolarizes both the atria. And that's when we get the P wave on the ECG. We'll see that in just a moment. When that wave of depolarization reaches the atrioventricular node or the AV node, it then travels from the atria to the ventricles and it passes through the AV node into the bundle of Hiss. And that allows the impulses to travel from the atria to the ventricles through an electrically inert region that separates the atrium and ventricles normally. That impulse gets into the ventricles via the bundle branches. We have the left bundle branch, which supplies the left heart, and the right bundle branch, which supplies the right heart. The left bundle branch splits into two further branches or fascicles, but we don't need to worry about that for tonight's webinar. So that's a basic overview of the electrical conduction system. And how does that fit into the ECG? Well, if you look at the ECG, we have a number of waves and we give those waves names or letters. The P wave is the first wave that we begin with and that represents atrial depolarization. So after that sinoatrial node fires, the atria depolarize and as they do so, they generate a small electrical current and we see that on the surface ECG as this small P wave. The impulse then travels, as we say, through the AV node into the ventricles and that incurs a slight delay which leads to a small gap uh, between the P wave and the QRS complex and that's the PR interval. When the ventricles depolarize via the bundle branches, that's when we get the QRS complex, the big spike on the ECG with each heartbeat. And then after the ventricles are depolarized, they need to repolarize or recharge ready for the next heartbeat. And that process of repolarization leads to the T wave on the ECG. So P, QRS and T are the three fundamental waves that we'll be looking at tonight. There are others, um, but we won't be covering those in this webinar. As I mentioned, we have some intervals as well on the ECG. So that gap between the start of atrial depolarization and the start of ventricular depolarization is known as a PR interval. We have the ST segment between the QRS complex and the T wave. That's particularly useful for looking at myocardial Adler infarction ischemia, as we'll learn a little bit later. And then we have the QT interval, which measures the total period of time taken for the ventricles to depolarize and then to repolarize. Again, we're not going to talk too much about the QT interval tonight, but it is very important to be aware of, as it is quite closely related to problems with serious arrhythmias. So let's begin with another fundamental question. And that is, why does an ECG have 12 leads? Why is it that we refer to a 12 lead ECG? Well, the reason why I ask this question is because we need to remember that leads are not the same as electrodes. People often talk about these wires or electrodes that attach to a patient as electrical leads, but that's poor use of terminology. Let's be very clear that the, the wires that attach to a patient are called electrodes. And in fact, the standard ECG machine has just 10 of those. There are four electrodes that attach to a patient's limbs, one to each arm, one to each leg, and then there are six electrodes that attach across the patient's chest, giving us a total of 10 electrodes we attach to the patient. The leads refer to what the ECG shows us. If you look at the ECG carefully, you'll see that there are 12 different leads or 12 different areas on the ECG, which I'll just highlight with my laser pointer here. In fact, I'll number those to make it even easier. And these are 12 different views of the heart. The ECG machine has very clever software in it that combines the electrical signals from the different uh, electrodes to provide different windows on the heart. We can look at the heart from different angles to look at what's going on electrically in different regions. And this is really important for identifying problems. Again, we'll see this later on when we look at myocardial Adler infarction. The 12 leads each have names and those names are shown on the screen now. We have the six limb leads shown over here on the left-hand side of the ECG. They're referred to 
one uh, uh, to us one, two, three, AVR, AVL, and AVF. We'll discuss shortly what those are looking at. And then we have six chest leads. But look at the heart from the uh, aspect of the chest. And those are labeled V1 through to V6. Again, we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail as we go through. Also, a standard ECG has a strip along the bottom that we call a rhythm strip. That's just one of the leads being shown for a long duration of time. Each of the leads that we see on an ECG shows a brief snippet of electrical activity, usually lasting about two and a half seconds, looking at the heart from different angles. To make rhythm analysis easier, across the bottom of the ECG, we have this rhythm strip. It's basically just lead two. It can be any lead that you select, but conventionally we tend to choose lead two, um, stretched out for a period of 10 seconds. And that allows us to analyze the ECG uh, more carefully to assess the heart rhythm. We'll be looking at some rhythm strips as we go through tonight's webinar. So that's the basics of what the ECG is showing us and how it's generated electrically. When we're handed an ECG for interpretation, what are we actually looking for? Well, we should adopt a standard approach to reading an ECG, which looks at each of the key components in turn. Taking a systematic approach ensures that we don't overlook anything of importance. So essentially what we're doing is following a kind of checklist. So we normally begin with the first item on the checklist, which is the heart rate. When we've assessed the heart rate, we should look at the heart rhythm, the axis, and then work through each of the components of the ECG in sequence. So we should look at a P wave, the PR interval, the QRS complex, the ST segment, the T wave, the QT interval, and then finally any extra waves that may or may not be present on the ECG. So that's a very quick overview of how we approach an ECG. Well, let's now put that into practice. Let's begin with a simple ECG to warm ourselves up. So we're gonna begin with case one, and we're gonna be looking at the first item on our checklist, which is heart rate. And the case that we're gonna look at is that of a 75 year old man who's presented to us complaining of fatigue. So this is his brief case history. He's a 75 year old male. He's presented complaining of a two month history of general fatigue and also has episodes of presyncope. From time to time, he feels a little dizzy. Let's take a look at his ECG. So this is a patient's 12 ECG that was recorded in the uh, clinic. And I'm going to ask you my first question. And the question that I'm going to ask you is what is this patient's heart rate? So if you know how to calculate heart rate, then do so now. In a moment, I'll give you a list of choices to choose from, and I'll see if you got the answer right. If you're not sure how to calculate heart rate, then wait just a moment and we'll show you exactly how to do it. So have a careful look at the ECG, calculate the heart rate if you can, and then we're gonna bring up our first poll. What is this patient's heart rate? Is it 33, 44, 55, or 66 beats per minute? Friends, if you want to launch the poll, we saw what people yep. think. Launched the poll. So the poll is now live. Please cast your vote and tell us what you think. So, yeah, vote count going up. 50% have voted. So please go ahead and cast your vote. I'm going to leave it. Open, so I think uh, people who are watching us on Facebook because we're live streaming this to Facebook can't vote. I'm, I'm sorry for that, it's not built into Zoom, but um, we're gonna share the results with you, obviously. So I'm gonna end the poll in three, two, one, end. And I'm gonna share the results. Uh, Andrew, do you wanna read them? Oh yeah, well, thank you to everyone for voting. Uh, so the most popular answer uh, was 44 beats per minute. That's answer B. 36% of people got that correct. So that's, that's great, well done. That is the correct answer, like I say. Um, uh, other people went for the other options. The next most popular answer was 55 beats per minute. Well, almost, but 44 beats per minute was the correct answer. So well, and, uh, Andrew, we had I, I, I 
didn't share my first poll question where I asked them about uh, about what their background was, and maybe we can do oh, yeah. that between this case and the next case. Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely, we'll do that. So yeah, well done to everyone who got that answer correct. Um, so let's now just talk about how do we calculate the heart rate? So for those people who got it right, this will be a, a useful reminder. For those who didn't get it right, then this is how we calculate heart rate. And there are several different ways of doing it. So let's begin with an ECG recording. The basis of heart rate calculation is knowing that ECGs are usually recorded at a standard rate, and that rate is 25 millimeters per second. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that the, the if you like the paper that goes through the ECG machine to record the ECG moves through that machine at a speed of 25 millimeters every second. And that's a crucial bit of information for then working out the duration of intervals on the ECG and for working out such issues as patient's heart rate. So let's go back to our ECG uh, and let's zoom in on uh, the rhythm. Let's zoom in on the QRX complex. And if we look at the ECG, we can see that the, the paper itself is divided up into squares. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there are lots of small squares, but also there are some slightly bigger squares, uh, just demarcated by slightly uh, a darker printed border. Let's begin with the small squares. Uh, the small squares are one millimeter in size. So each of those small squares that you see is one millimeter across. So we can calculate heart rates by counting small squares between the QRS complexes. What do I mean by that? Well, we've said that the paper moves through the ECG machine. It, it's recorded at a speed of 25 millimeters per second. That basically is 25 small squares every second. So every minute, that machine is moving by 1,500 small squares. So what we need to do is simply add up the number of small squares between two adjacent QRS complexes. And I've done that for you. And if you uh, look carefully at the ECG and you count up each of those small squares, you'll see that there are 34 of them between each of those QRS complexes. So if we know that there's 34 small squares between each QRS complex, and if we know that there's 1,500 small squares every minute, then it's fairly simple to work out the patient's heart rate. We simply take 1,500 and divide it by the number of small squares we've counted. So 1,500 divided by 34, which gives you a heart rate of 44 beats per minute. And that's the correct answer that we had on that uh, initial poll question. Let's have a quick look at the bigger squares because there's another method to working out heart rate. It is after all a little bit cumbersome to sit there counting laboriously all the tiny squares on uh, an ECG ribbon strip. So a slightly quicker way is by counting big squares. So the large squares on an ECG strip measure five millimeters in size. So if the ECG paper moves at 25 millimeters per second, it moves at five large squares every second, which means that it moves at 300 large squares every minute. So exactly the same principle that we had before the small squares. What we do is we add up the number of large squares between two QRS complexes. In this case, there's seven, and we divide 300 by seven. And that gives us an answer of 43. Now you'll notice that's not quite the same as what we had with the small squares, that was 44, but that's because this is slightly less precise. We don't have that precision of measuring small squares in this case, we're using larger squares, and it gives you an answer that's not quite as accurate, but it's good enough for most clinical purposes. So a quick and easy way of working out heart rate is just to count up the number of big squares between two QRS complexes, divide it into 300, and that will give you the heart rate in beats per minute. So this patient's heart rate is 44 beats per minute. So what was our final diagnosis? Well, certainly a diagnosis was that of sinus bradycardia. We'll talk more about sinus rhythm in just a moment. But that should never be a final diagnosis. As clinicians, we should always keep asking the question, why? Whenever somebody gives you a piece of information about a patient, if they give you a diagnosis about a patient, always ask why. As clinicians, we should be perpetually curious. So sure, he has sinus bradycardia, but why does he have sinus bradycardia? 
why is this patient bradycardic? Well, that required further investigation. And what we did was we assessed his thyroid function tests. We checked his T4, T3 and TSH, and we found that he had a low T4 and a high TSH. So his final diagnosis from our point of view was that of hypothyroidism. This patient had fatigue and dizziness. He had sinus bradycardia. He was hypothyroid. Even that's not necessarily a final diagnosis. If you're an endocrine specialist, you may ask, why is he hypothyroid? I guess that's a, a question for another webinar. But nevertheless, always ask that question why, and it will lead you to the fundamental reason why your patient is presented to you. So that's case one. Should we break for a moment here and then just go back to that poll that Franz mentioned a moment ago, just to assess people's level of experience. We've also got, we've already got a slight guide to that from the, the answers we had earlier, but let's find out. We're gonna take a poll yeah. now to ask people, what level of experience do you have as a clinician? Okay, hold on. I'll relaunch poll and please tell us your background. This would be very interesting for us. I was actually supposed to share this when we started, but I forgot. So sharing it between those uh, cases. So the potential answers are, are you a resident fellow, a specialist? So are you done with your fellowship or residency and already working as a, as a specialist? Are you a registered nurse, physician assistant, medical student, other student, pre-med or other? Will be really interesting to know that and um, I'm going to stop in three two one so the results are here so I think we have uh, yeah maybe maybe Andrew you want to yeah we, we have a, a, an interesting spread we, we have a lot of people with a lot of varied experience so the uh, the largest group are uh, pre-meds so uh, welcome to all pre-meds. 21% of our uh, audience this evening are, are pre-meds. 15% are medical students. 6% are other students. Um, but we've also got 9% registered nurses. We've got 1% physician assistants. And uh, we've got um, uh, quite a number of residents, uh, MD specialists as well, and some fellows. So a very awesome. broad range of uh, people tonight. Nice, nice. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Well, thank you to all for, for joining us. Okay, so let's move on to our second case. We said this is going to be a case-based webinar. Um, we've talked about heart rate. Let's move on to the next element of ECG um, interpretation, which is heart rhythm. Uh, and we're going to look at a case, which is uh, essentially just a routine screening ECG. So this is uh, an ECG from a 58-year-old salesman. He's completely well, he's asymptomatic, and he simply came to us because he was uh, referred for a medical exam for life insurance purposes. So this is uh, his ECG, or this is a portion of his ECG. Um, and I'm gonna begin actually with the, uh, the question that I had for a previous patient, which is, uh, what is this patient's heart rate? So shall we apply the principles that we've, we've just used? So let's count up big squares. Uh, if we look at the QRS complexes, look carefully at the whole ECG, um, as we always should for, um, uh, for interpreting it. Let's begin with the large squares. So between QRS complexes, we have 10 and a half large squares. So if you remember, we count up the large squares, we divide it into 300, and that should give us our heart rate. And so 300 divided by 10.5 is a heart rate of 29 beats per minute, which is a bit of a surprise for an asymptomatic person who's come to us for an insurance medical. So my question to you, because if you get a surprise and you get a result that you're not expecting, you should always question it. Remember, we should always be curious clinicians who always question everything. So as I wasn't expecting a heart rate of 29 beats per minute, um, I have a question for you. And the question is, is this true or false? This patient's heart rate is 29 beats per minute. Is that true or is that false? So we've launched the poll. Select your option and tell us what you think. Is this true or is this false? Okay, 60% have voted. 70% of attendees have voted almost. So I'm gonna give you three, two, one, and end the poll. 
hear the results. Excellent. So two thirds of you believe it's false. One third of you believe that it's true. So clearly you think I've made a mistake somewhere. I'm wrong when I say this is 29 beats per minute. Um, and you're right. Uh, it is uh, wrong. It is false. This patient's heart rate is not 29 beats per minute. Uh, and the reason that I'm tricking you with this ECG is just to really give you a learning point. Because I talked about counting squares, and if you remember, the fundamental principle of counting squares is having a standard rate for your ECG recording, which is 25 millimeters per second. But if you look carefully at the ECG machine on your ECG cart, you'll notice that sometimes you can select alternative speeds. There's sometimes good reasons for doing this. And occasionally when people select a different paper speed, they forget to change it back to the standard. So everybody else starts getting EKGs that look very unusual. So if you look carefully at this ECG, remember I said always look carefully at the ECG. Uh, at the bottom of the ECG, you should always see a note of the paper speed. And this paper has been moving at twice the normal speed. It's been moving at 50 millimeters per second because that's what the machine has been set up to do. So uh, it's not allowing us to calculate the heart rate in the normal way. Dividing large squares into 300 is not going to work here. You're gonna to have to use a, a different method or better, you're gonna to have to reset the ECG machine to record a normal speed. So that's what we did. So the machine is now set at 25 millimeters per second. And I'm pleased to report that when you do that, everything is back to normal. We get a, a normal heart rate and a result that we expect. So the learning point there is always just check that your ECG has been recorded at the normal paper speed. Okay, well, I said that this portion of the webinar was about rhythm. So let's use this opportunity to look at this patient's normal ECG and take a look at normal sinus rhythm. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that every time the sinus node depolarizes, it leads to a ventricular depolarization. In other words, every P wave, which represents the atria depolarizing, should be followed by a QRS complex. And that is indeed the case. So in a normal ECG and normal heart rhythm, normal sinus rhythm, you should have a one-to-one -one relationship, one P wave to one QRS. Conversely, every QRS should be preceded by a P wave. So you should never have more P waves than QRSs. You should never have more QRSs than P waves. That's not always the case. So if we have a look at a, a different rhythm, we can see that that doesn't apply. So here we have QRS complexes. We have six showing on your screen at a moment. But if you look at the uh, P waves, we have a lot more P waves than QRSs. So this is not normal sinus rhythm. And this is a patient with third degree or complete heart block. We'll come to that, uh, back to that a little bit later. But uh, basically when you're assessing rhythm, always look at the relationship between atrial depolarization and ventricular depolarization. Do your P's and your QRS's match up? And if not, why not? Sometimes we don't see P waves and sometimes we can see other forms of atrial activity. This is an example of atrial flutter. Uh, you see those um, uh, waves on the baseline of ECG. They don't look like normal P waves. There's a lot of them for a start. And these are what we call flutter waves. In atrial flutter, you have a circuit of electrical activity going round and round in the atria, usually in the, the right atrium, occasionally the left atrium. And each time that impulse makes a circuit of the atrium, it creates a flutter wave. So this patient's no longer in normal sinus rhythm, they now have atrial flutter. And that, that pattern that we see of flutter waves is sometimes referred to as a sawtooth pattern. In other words, it looks like the teeth along the edge of a saw. So if you look at the ECG, you can see how the, uh, the atrial flutter looks like the edge of a saw. It's worth noting, however, that the ECG is the only way of making this diagnosis of atrial flutter. You can't make this diagnosis clinically. In other words, if you look at the QRS complexes, you'll see that they're perfectly regular. If you look at the heart rate, if you look at the gap between the QRS complexes, you can calculate a heart rate of 80 beats per minute. So if you were to do a standard bedside or office pulse check, that patient would have a regular pulse at 80 beats per minute. You would believe that they're in normal sinus rhythm. And it's only when you do the ECG that you see that there's actually abnormal atrial activity. Again, it just goes to show how valuable the ECG is as a diagnostic tool. We also have other forms of atrial arrhythmia, and this is the commonest um, uh, persistent arrhythmia. This is atrial fibrillation. 
uh, where there's no organized atrial activity at all. So you can see that the, the baseline looks somewhat chaotic. There's no um, obvious P waves. There's no real flutter waves of irregularity, but nothing of that sawtooth characteristic that we saw earlier. So this is atrial fibrillation, and this is something that is certainly important to spot. As well as the lack of atrial um, coordinated activity, you'll also notice that the ventricular rhythm is irregular. It's irregularly irregular. Uh, and this is the hallmark of atrial fibrillation. Uh, a lack of coordinated atrial activity and an irregularly irregular heart rhythm. And that brings me on to my next question about heart rate. We haven't left the issue of heart rate behind just yet, because how do you measure heart rate when the heart rhythm is irregular? If you remember, we talked about measuring heart rate by counting squares, but how do you count squares between QRS complexes if the rhythm is irregular? If we look back at this uh, atrial fibrillation ECG, you'll see that some QRS complexes are far apart and some are close together. It's what you'd expect of an irregular rhythm. So are you gonna count the large number of big squares? Are you gonna count the small number? How are you gonna calculate the heart rate? And what we really need to do is calculate an average heart rate for that ECG. So this is the third and final method for calculating the heart rate. And that's by counting the number of QRS complexes along the rhythm strip at the bottom of the ECG. Why do we do that? Well, on a standard ECG recorded at a standard speed, the rhythm strip should be 50 large squares long. In other words, it captures 10 seconds of heart rhythm. So what we can do is simply count up the number of QRS complexes that are along that rhythm strip. So, we can add those up and there are 11. So we know that we've got 11 complexes in 10 seconds. So what's the heart rate? Well, it's gonna be 11 times six, which will give you a heart rate of 66 beats per minute. So if you're faced with an irregular rhythm, be it uh, uh, ventricular ectopic beats, be it um, uh, atrial fibrillation or whatever, you can still calculate heart rates by adding up QRS complexes. There's always a way to solve the problem. Okay, let's move on from rate and rhythm. Uh, I'm gonna skip over axis because axis is quite complicated and certainly a lot of people find it quite challenging and it's probably more than we can fit into this webinar tonight. So we'll come back to that perhaps another day. Let's move on to the P wave and let's look at another case. This is a 65 year old man with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, his case history is that he's 65 and he's had an acute admission with an infective exacerbation of COPD. And on admission to the uh, emergency, emergency room, he had an ECG recorded. Uh, and this is his ECG. And I was really wondering what you think about the P waves on this ECG. So remember, we said we should look at each component of the ECG in turn. So we should look at rate, we should look at rhythm, we should look at axis. And then we begin by looking at the components. And we need to look at a P waves. And um, what I'd be interested in, in really is what you think about a P waves, particularly in uh, this area of ECG, if I can just get my uh, laser pointer, just in this area of ECG here, in fact, if I circle them, I can show you these P waves here. Now, these are actually big P waves. Um, they're enlarged. And how big should a P wave normally be? Well, a normal P wave should normally be less than 0.25 of a millivolt, which equates to two and a half small squares. So normally a P wave should be no bigger than two and a half small squares on the ECG. These are significantly bigger than that. And these measure about four small squares in size. So these are abnormally big P waves. Now, if you remember, we said that P waves are generated by the atria. So if you have big P waves, that usually indicates that the atria are enlarged. Um, and there are lots of reasons that can happen. Uh, in this patient's case, it's because he's got COPD and his COPD is putting strain on the right-hand side of the heart. We call that core pulmonale. And that's causing a back pressure on the atria, which is stretching them, enlarging the right atrium and giving you large P waves as a result. That brings me on to my next poll question. And this is a more general clinical question, which is what else can cause right atrial enlargement? So, Franz, do you want to launch a poll for this? Okay, the poll is live. 
That's great. So I'm interested to hear what people think can cause right atrial enlargement. So in which situations might you see large P waves on the ECG? Pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary valve stenosis, tricuspid valve stenosis, or maybe all of the above? What do you think? You're not specifically asking them about their guess what the previous ECG showed. No, this is a more know in general, general question. Absolutely. Yes. It's a more general question. Because the, the ECG you showed gives away some hints, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 65, 66, 70% have voted. So I'm going to give you three more seconds. Please cast your vote. Three, two, one. Ending the poll. I'm sharing the results. Excellent. People are doing well. So 71% of people believe that it's D, but it's all of the above. And that's the correct answer. So each of these conditions can cause right atrial enlargement. And like I said, with the patient we just looked at, it's because they put strain on the, the right heart and strain on the, the right atrium, particularly. So you get right atrial enlargement in pulmonary hypertension. You get uh, pressure overload of the right heart and right atrial enlargement uh, in some cases of pulmonary valve stenosis. And uh, you also get um, pressure overload and right atrial dilatation in tricuspid valve stenosis. So the answer is all of the above. Well done. Okay, so let's move and on. I, are you going to just uh, explain to us what you think or what, or what the, the ECG showed? Or don't yeah, we yeah. have time for that? So, uh, absolutely. Um, so if I go back to our patient's ECG, in fact, it shows quite a lot. So um, I've mentioned already, it, it shows large uh, P waves. So this patient had right atrial enlargement that was confirmed by echocardiography. Uh, in fact, he had core pulmonale. So he had a, a, a dilated right heart, a failing right heart, because he had pulmonary hypertension as a consequence of his COPD. So again, it's a question of why, isn't it? You know, this patient has COPD, why does he have pulmonary hypertension? Because he has COPD. Why does he have right heart dysfunction? Because he has pulmonary hypertension. And it's this cascade of questions that lead you to the answers. As a result of those right heart abnormalities, he also has other abnormalities on the ECG. So again, we don't have time to go into this, but for those of you who do have some experience of ECG interpretation, you might notice that he has a partial right bundle branch block. He's got evidence of right ventricular hypertrophy. He's got axis deviation, he's got right axis deviation, all of which can be part and parcel of somebody who's got right heart dysfunction as a result of COPD. So there's a lot going on on this ECG, but I particularly wanted to use it as a chance to teach. Yeah, and uh, Aliyah asks, uh, please explain ECG, why rabbit ears on lower limb bleeds? Uh, the rabbit ears are, are particularly useful in the in, um, diagnosis of uh, broad complex tachycardias. I'm not so sure if, if they are so helpful in, in, in this case, uh, Andrew, what's your- No, I, what's I don't your... think so. I mean, we, uh, you know, we, 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 we can talk about rabbit ears in the context of bundle branch blocks, et cetera, but I'm not sure mm. it, it's, it's particularly useful in this case. And certainly sadly, we mm. probably don't have time to talk about bundle branch blocks much as I'd love to mm. um, in the context of this. And it's probably taking things a stage beyond where, where people are ready to go at this, this yeah. particular moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move on in that case um, uh, to another case, which is looking now at PR intervals. So next case in our sequence. Uh, and again, we're looking at an incidental finding in a 70 year old man. So this is a 12 ECG from uh, a patient who's 70 years of age. Um, and uh, we weren't looking for any problems. We weren't expecting any problems, um, but I was wondering what you think about his PR interval. So we'll, we'll take a closer look at the ECG in just a moment, but let me just remind you what a PR interval should look like. So here's a normal ECG. And if you remember, we have the P wave, the QRS complex, and the PR interval measures the interval, the time from the start of the P wave, from the start of atrial depolarization to the start of the QRS complex, to the start of ventricular depolarization. Um, and normally the PR interval in ECG is between 0.12 and 0.20 of a second. That equates to three to five small squares. And that represents the time delay between the start of the atria depolarizing and the start of the ventricles depolarizing. And much of that time delay is taken up by the AV node, 
which introduces a, a slight delay to impulses passing from atria to ventricles. We see that as the, uh, the PR interval. When we have abnormalities of the PR interval, that usually indicates a problem uh, in or around the AV node. So let's go back to our patient's ECG um, and let's have a look at his PR interval. So beginning of a P wave to beginning of a QRS complex, and it looks a little bit long. If you measure that, that's actually six small squares. That's 0.24 of a second. If you remember, that is longer than the normal upper limit. So this patient has got a long PR interval. And this is what we call first degree atrioventricular block, first degree heart block. And essentially, it just indicates that the AV node is getting a little sluggish. It's not conducting impulses quite as quickly uh, as it normally would. And there are lots of reasons that, that can happen. So it can happen in uh, intrinsic disease of the AV node, such as fibrosis of the node. It can occur in, in normal individuals with high vagal tone. So, for example, people who are athletic or even people who are just asleep overnight. We sometimes see it in acute myocardial infarction, in myocarditis, um, electrolyte disturbances, and also with certain medications. And the medications that uh, affect the AV node, uh, that increase the refractory time of the AV node, um, include commonly used drugs, such as calcium channel blockers, uh, beta blockers, cardiac glycosides, and also cholinesterase inhibitors. So again, always ask that question why, if you see first degree AV block, um, on an ECG, it's not necessarily something to worry about, um, but it's always something which should prompt that question, why is the patient on medication or has he got some kind of problem going on that's causing this finding on the ECG? So let's move on to another poll question. Again, it's a general question that uh, we lead on to, um, and that is, which of these conditions does not cause first degree AV block? So I've just listed a whole load of conditions that can cause AV block, but which of these does not cause first degree AV block? So the poll is active if you want to cast your vote. Which of these conditions does not cause first degree atrioventricular block? People are casting their vote. 50% have voted. So please let us know what you think. And um, if possible, those who join us through Zoom, uh, put your uh, vote in the in the poll, not in the not in the um, chat. So I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results. Andrew, please, could you tell us what people yeah, voted so for? Well done. Most people have that correct. So 60% of our audience uh, got the correct answer, which is Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, very briefly, uh, is a condition in which you have an accessory pathway that essentially bypasses the AV node and that allows rapid conduction between the atrium ventricles. So Wolf Parkinson White syndrome typically gives you a short PR interval, not a long one. All the other conditions on that list, the ones we've already mentioned, which can cause AV node dysfunction and do indeed cause first degree AV block. Okay, so well done for everyone who said Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Whilst we're there, looking at the uh, PR interval, I'll just mention other forms of heart block. Uh, as the name first degree AV block suggests, there is also second degree AV block. Uh, and that's where you get prolongation of a PR interval. It gradually prolongs with each heartbeat until eventually a P wave is not conducted at all. And we call this Mobitz type one, second degree AV block. Essentially, the AV node is not just tired, but it's getting increasingly tired with each heartbeat that it has to process to the point where it then fails to conduct altogether. That failure of conduction gives the AV node a, a chance to catch up and to reset. And so the PR interval goes back to normal for next heartbeat. And then again, it gradually lengthens out until you get non-conduction of the P wave. And this cycle repeats. It's not necessarily a problem if a patient is asymptomatic. We wouldn't necessarily automatically pace a patient with Mobitz type 1 uh, AV block, uh, but it's something that we would think very carefully about. It depends partly upon where the level of a block is found. There's also a Mobitz 2 second degree AV block. So second degree AV block is characterized by some P waves not being conducted at all. And in second degree Mobitz 2 AV block, but you don't get that progressive lengthening of a PR interval. The non-conduction of a P wave is intermittent. 
And that means that the AV node is now behaving more erratically. That's a little bit more worrying. You're never quite sure when it might fail altogether. So normally we would think about a permanent pacemaker for patients with Mobis too. And then the third and final form of AV block is third degree AV block or complete heart block. And this is where the atria and the ventricles are no longer communicating. The AV node is not conducting at all and the atria are doing one thing and the ventricles are doing another. So you get independent activity between the atria and the ventricles. Okay, so after the PR interval, we come to the QRS complex. And I'm gonna tell you about a patient who presented to us with an episode of chest pain. So this is a 52 year old man whose episode of chest pain was actually about six weeks ago. He woke up during the night, had a few hours of really quite severe central chest pain, but didn't seek medical attention. Um, he's got a past history of hypertension and tobacco use. And a few weeks after this episode, he had a uh, abnormal ECG in the community and he was referred to us to advise upon uh, his findings. So this is his ECG. And when we hear a story like this, we always wonder whether the patient may have had a myocardial infarction. Did he have an infarct six weeks ago that he simply didn't present with? And what are we going to look for in the ECG for an infarct? Well, we're going to look for Q waves for an old infarct. Q waves are uh, the feature of an infarct that appear late and, and often remain lifelong after a myocardial infarction. And when we look at his ECG, we can indeed see Q waves. Q waves are the negative deflection at the start of the QRS complex. If you look at most of these complexes, you'll see that the uh, deflections are upwards. But if you look at leads 2, 3, and AVF, you'll see that the initial deflection is downwards. That means that there's a Q wave in leads 2, 3, and AVF. So this patient has indeed had a myocardial infarction, which presumably occurred about six weeks ago. So my question to you from this ECG is which territory of the heart has been affected by this myocardial infarction? So here's the poll. Is it the anterior wall of the left ventricle, the posterior, the inferior or the lateral? Which territory of the heart has been affected? You want to cast your votes now. Okay. 40% have voted. Well, please tell us what you think. And I'm gonna end the poll in three, two, one. And here are the results. Excellent. So people are doing really well tonight. Um, so 72% of people got the correct answer, which is that this is an inferior myocardial infarction. Uh, and I'll show you why in just a moment. So, well done to those of you who said inferior, that's correct. So I mentioned that the ECG gives us different windows on the heart. We have 12 leads, which means 12 different views of the heart. And by knowing which lead looks at which part of the heart, we can work out which part of the heart may be affected by pathology. So we have six, what we call limb leads. We have four electrodes, one on each limb which you use to generate six limb leads or six views of the heart from the limbs. And I can bring up a diagram here that shows you where these views are looking at the heart from. So if we look at these uh, leads here, two, three and AVF, which is where we saw the Q waves, we can see that they're looking at the heart from the inferior aspect. So two, three and AVF are looking at the inferior aspect of the heart. Lead AVL over here is looking at the heart from the perspective of the patient's left shoulder. So we'll pick up uh, abnormalities in the lateral wall of the heart as we'll lead one, again seen here, uh, which is also looking at the lateral wall of the left ventricle. AVR is a bit of an outlier. So AVR looks at the heart from the aspect of the right shoulder. For a long time, we, we tended to ignore AVR, but it's actually quite useful. Uh, and just to mention as an aside, if we see evidence of an acute infarction in lead AVR, that often means it's a bad infarction, one that's affecting the left main stem and one that's quite threatening. So we don't like it when we see infarcts in AVR. But the other leads have the traditional names of inferior. So these are the inferior leads looking at the inferior surface of the heart, two, three and AVF, and lateral, which are one and AVL. 
If we can move over to the chest lead, so we have six chest electrodes, which are placed across the chest like so, and they look at the heart from different uh, vantage points. And so V1 and V2 are looking uh, at the septum of the heart. They get a good view uh, perpendicular to the septum. Leads V3 and V4 look at the anterior surface of the heart and leads V5 and V6 look at the lateral aspect of the heart, just like one and AVM earlier. So by knowing which parts of the heart these 12 leads look at, we can work out which part of the heart is affected by pathology. So when we saw our patient's ECG with Q waves inferiorly, we expected that his cardiac imaging would show an infarct on the inferior aspect of the left ventricle. So one of my interests is cardiac MRI, and this is his cardiac MRI scan showing a cross section of the left ventricle. And we can see that he has uh, an infarct of the inferior wall here, which is thinned and moves less well. It's hypokinetic compared to the rest of the heart. If we look at our late guard linear imaging, we can see contrast in the inferior wall, which highlights scar tissue. So he's got an inferior scar from his infarct. So the MRI matches what we saw on the ECG. And that's the value of ECGs for locating pathology in the heart. Okay, let's stick with the ST segment very quickly for one further case. Uh, and this is a referral from the ER. Um, and maybe um, maybe I, can, I can just interject. There are some questions uh, relating to this and, uh, and previous cases. And I think it's best for us to answer them after we're done. We have eight more minutes until uh, we're at the end of the formal session. So Android, I don't know if we wanna kind of make this the last and final case. Yeah, absolutely, we can fit in one more case, possibly two if we're quick, but, but let's have a go. So let's fit in. We can, and, no problem. Yeah, and so, then we can answer your questions. Absolutely. So this is a 48-year-old um, man who presented acutely to the uh, emergency room with severe chest pain uh, onset one hour ago, accompanied by nausea and diaphoresis, uh, and he had a past history of hypertension. And this is his ECG, uh, and what I wanted to show you was the evidence that he's having an acute myocardial infarction. So for an acute infarct, we look for ST segment elevation. So we're looking at the ST segment, and what we're seeing is elevation of the ST segment. So we have the isoelectric line here, and we have the ST segment, which is elevated above the isoelectric line in these leads. If you remember, these are the inferior leads. So this is a patient who's having an inferior uh, ST segment uh, myocardial infarction. And this gives us clues as to which coronary artery may be affected. Uh, we know that the coronary arteries supply specific territories, some overlap, but they generally supply specific territories. And we know that the right coronary artery in most people supplies the inferior wall. So when this patient has his coronary angiogram, we'd expect to find an acute occlusion in the right coronary artery, which is indeed what we did find. We can identify other forms of um, ST elevation as well. This is an infralateral um, STEMI. So this is a patient who's got ST elevation both in the inferior leads and also in the lateral leads. And then we have another ECG here with ST elevation. Uh, and my question here is which territory of the heart is affected here? So let's just test your learning over the last five minutes. Can you identify which leads and therefore which territory of the heart has been affected by this myocardial infarction. So we've got a poll for you. So is this an anteroseptal STEMI, an infraposterior, an infralateral, or a lateral STEMI? So if you cast your vote. Okay, votes are coming in. Looking good. Uh, 60% have voted. I'm going to give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. And here are the results. Again, everyone's doing really well. So exactly two thirds of people have the right answer, which is this is an anteroseptal ST elevation myocardial infarction. So the ST segment elevation that we're seeing is in leads V1 to V4 primarily. And those are the septal and anterior uh, leads. So it's an antraceptal infarct. Okay, would you like one more case, friends, or would you like to go to the questions? Um, 
what do the the participants uh, think? Are you are you up for more cases? Case, case, case. One more, one more. Case, case, case. Yeah. Okay. One more. I guess people are are yeah. So in my case, I'm going to skip to case eight, which is um, uh, the uh, the T wave. So let's have a look at the T wave. So I'll skip case seven. Let's go to case eight, and it's another case from the ER. So this is a 54 year old female who presented to the ER with chest pain, and she's got a lifelong history of type one uh, diabetes. Uh, and when she presented with chest pain, this was her ECG. And what I really wanted to point out here were the T waves. Uh, and you'll see it was quite widespread inversion of the T waves. So most of the T waves normally point upwards. They're normally upright on the ECG. But I'm hoping it's fairly clear here that a lot of the T waves are pointing downwards. Um, uh, and in fact, in the uh, antraceptal leads in particular, it's quite dramatic. So V1 to V4, there is deep um, uh, symmetrical uh, T wave inversion. And the reason that I just wanted to show you this is because it's a really important pattern to look for on an ECG when someone presents with chest pain. In fact, we give it a name and it, it's known as Wellen's sign. Uh, and in fact, it's so significant, it's sometimes called Wellen's warning. And it's named for uh, a, a cardiologist known as Henrik Wellens. He's a Dutch cardiologist who sadly died just um, uh, a few months ago, earlier this year. Um, and he described this uh, ECG finding. And the reason that he described it and, and highlighted it in particular is because it's usually associated with a stenosis um, in the proximal LAD or the left main stem. So it's usually a very proximal left coronary artery stenosis, um, sometimes referred to as a, as a widow maker stenosis. Um, if this artery occludes, the patient is often in deep, deep trouble. So when we see an ECG that looks like this, um, then we, we need to think that this patient may have serious coronary artery disease, it may have serious consequences. And this is somebody that I would want to get to the cath lab pretty quickly. Um, so Wellen's uh, uh, warning is one that you should always heed uh, very carefully indeed. Okay, so that's that case. Uh, I can ask more questions if you like, or if you want to ask me questions, that's fine as well, whatever you like, friends. So uh, we have a question um, from Juan who says, I see normal, uh, I see T wave uh, are normally positive except for V1. So is it normal for a T wave to be negative in V1? So it is normal for T wave to be negative in V1. I wouldn't be particularly worried. Uh, in some cases, um, uh, particularly in younger patients, it can be normal in V1 and, and V2. Um, but uh, V1, I would be happy to accept a negative T wave. Okay, got it. Thanks. Um, then, so we have questions from previous cases, but maybe uh, before we go into answering these, these previous questions, um, you have a slide showing uh, your books. Maybe we can, we can show them real quick so people can know where they can get more of your teaching uh, in, your, in your books, in your ECG books, mm -hmm. but obviously also on McMastery where you are teaching quite a couple of, um, of courses, right, among in, in others. Detail. Yeah, so, so we've covered a lot of ground tonight, but, but in a lot more detail, you'll find cases just like this in my ECG books that are available on Amazon.com in whichever country you're, you're uh, tuning in from. Uh, if you just search for my name, um, the word ECG, you'll find it on Amazon. Uh, and I have the fifth edition of my ECG book. It's newly out this year. Uh, and it contains this systematic approach of going through the ECG with lots of examples um, uh, and lots of cases to look at. And then I have a separate companion book, um, uh, which contains nothing but clinical cases, which you can test yourself on. So it's a great way to learn the ECG and then to test yourself on the cases book. Uh, and as you say, we have a number of workshops uh, on MedMastery, which uh, I've worked on, but other people as well, including yourself, friends, uh, and uh, different levels of workshop uh, the yellow, blue, and black belts, perfectly tailored for whatever level you feel ready for with your ECG skill set. Exactly the the analogy to karate or whatever you want to, uh, which which martial arts uh, domain you want to.
pick. So yellow belt for beginners, blue belt is, is um, where we cover the rhythm problems. And then the workshop, the black belt workshop, where you can really test the knowledge. There's really some, some fun stuff in there. I think, uh, uh, Andrew, I think even you, you, you put, you had one case where of a patient that had two hearts, right? If I remember correctly. <laughs> yes. So that's, that's, cool that's like Absolutely. a very, very much black belt, you know, like interpreting an ECG of someone <laughs> who has two hearts. So, um, and um, yeah, so I guess uh, we want to end this also. Uh, Ed, do you want to, before we answer the questions, do you want to say something about uh, med school coach and what people can get from, from you guys? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, um, Andrew, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Yeah, after, after many years in practice, I think I finally have a feeling for the ECG. So thank you, <laughs> thank you Ed. Sure. Um, well, in, in, in terms of, you know, uh, med school coach, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that this great lecture has stimulated all of our thinking, and this is especially directed towards the pre-meds, whose um, goal and ambition is to gain entrance into medical school and hopefully begin uh, reading uh, ECGs someday. So med school coach offers a variety of services, especially advising. Uh, and again, it's especially in the United States, it's a very complicated process getting into medical school. So uh, if we can be of help, the bottom line is you don't have to go it alone. And so we are here to help. You, you get them into medical school, but also through medical school from what I understand, right? Well, that's, yes, absolutely. You know, it's, it's longitudinal. Um, you know, we mentor and uh, we really provide a full range of services, but it just begins at the, uh, at the time that people are interested in a medical career and trying to gain access into medical school. But then we continue as their career path um, uh, develops, uh, we're there to help and we're there to uh, assist in any way that we can. Awesome, awesome. So I think we can uh, answer some questions that are left over from the from the webinar. Would you be up for that, Andrew? Yeah, have a guess. So uh, does Franz, a... Franz, am I allowed to ask a question? Of course. <laughs> All right, well, Please. Just, just a quick one, a quick one. Um, you know, especially coming from a background of diagnostic radiology, I know that um, um, digitization automation has been uh, um, important for us. Uh, especially with digital imaging, and we've used uh, computer-assisted, computer-aided diagnosis. It meshes very well with our cross-sectional imaging, CT, MRI, uh, digital mammography. So my question is, has digitization and automation found its way into ECG interpretation and cardiovascular diagnosis? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I think um, a great example of that is actually the way that uh, patients and the public are using their own ECG machines to monitor their rhythms. A great example is the Apple Watch. And I'm astonished at what the Apple Watch can do. I have patients who present now um, to me saying, look at what my Apple Watch has found. I've got atrial fibrillation. And these are automated algorithms which are actually monitoring the patient's heart rhythm picking up arrhythmias, diagnosing them. It, it's astonishing what they can do. With more general ECG machines, um, I, they will often offer an automated interpretation of ECG. It gets better all the time. I still find they're generally oversensitive, as is the Apple Watch, to be fair. Um, so they will generally pick up problems when there is no problem there. Um, they're generally, uh, if they say that the rhythm's normal, they're normally right because they're so sensitive, uh, if, if they say it's normal, then uh, th 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 you know, they, it usually is a normal rhythm. Um, but if they say there's a problem, then you do need a clinician just to check that and confirm if there really is a problem there or if it's just uh, being oversensitive to, to some minor glitch on the ECG. But certainly, yes, automation is, is becoming increasingly part of our lives. It certainly sounds like there's, there's no um, substitute for uh, ECG uh, expertise in interpreting. Not yet, at least. <laughs> we get uh, lots of questions where they can watch, uh, where you guys can watch the recording of this webinar. And if you register for a mastery trial account, if you don't already have that, we're going to actually send you an email and let you know where you can find it. Otherwise, um, just make sure to follow us on Facebook because recording will also be uh, put there. And so if, that, if you do that, those two things, then you're all set. Um, so 
we have uh, questions uh, regarding P wave. Does a, uh, Jackson asks, does a large P wave only refer to height or width of the wave too? So it can be the width as well. And, and uh, classically with left atrial enlargement, we, we tend to see a, a broad P wave because it takes longer to depolarize. So that duration of time um, uh, that it takes to depolarize is, is manifested as a widening of a P wave. In other words, it's, it stretches for a longer period of time. And there's no hard and fast rule to this, but there's a general principle um, about two and a half small squares is, is where I'd put my upper limit for the duration of a P wave. In, in the old days, we used to refer to the terms P pulmonale and P mitrale. Um, it's, a, it's a bit outdated now, so I wouldn't encourage people to, to use those terms, but you'll read about them. And P pulmonale classically refers to big P waves. That you can classically see uh, with right atrial enlargement. Uh, and as the name suggests, that's classically due to pulmonary conditions, although not exclusively. P mitrale, the broad, often bifid P wave, so it has a, 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 a double hump to it, um, is, is what is associated with mitral valve stenosis. And that's the classical left atrial enlargement that you get with mitral stenosis that causes that left atrial enlargement. Uh, and again, prolongation of the duration of the, uh, the P wave. So P pulmonale, P mitrale, old fashioned terms, but they, they're still useful to carry around. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Isaiah. How does abnormal potassium levels lead to abnormal T waves? So um, it, it varies depending upon the level of, of abnormality, but as a general rule, if you have high potassium, so hyperkalemia, you get high T waves. So remember, high potassium, high T waves. Classically, you get tall tenting of the T, T waves. So they, they look very large. Um, with uh, hypokalemia, you generally get small T waves, maybe even inverted T waves. So low potassium equals low T waves or small T waves. I, when you uh, brought the example of how to uh, estimate the, um, the rate on the irregular rhythm strip. Uh, it actually was not a rhythm strip, but on the irregular uh, rhythm, when you multiply it by, by six, can you repeat that real quick? Because yeah. quite a couple of people got confused there and we still have oh, questions it, from that. It's a is lot it, to pack in. It is, it is covered in the books as well. Like why, why multiply by six and stuff? So that's, the, okay. yeah, yes. people you, confused you there a little bit. Standard 12 DCG. Can you show the ECG? Can, yeah, can sure. you move can. back to, the, to, to it okay. so we see it? Back and uh, let me just find that it's a little bit further back here. So uh, here we go. There you go, that should be showing now. So it's a standard 12 DCG recorded at the standard um, uh, 25 millimeters per second. Um, and when you have a standard ribbon strip at the bottom, so uh, along the bottom of the ECG, as we see here, um, that will typically be 10 seconds long. So if you measure the length of that in big squares, it is 50 big squares long. Um, if you remember, you get 300 big squares per minute. So it is one sixth of a minute. It is 10 seconds, one sixth of a minute. So basically that is a 10 second strip of the heart rhythm. So if you want the heart rate uh, uh, in beats every 10 seconds, just add them up. There's 11 QRS complexes every 10 seconds. So you want beats per minute, which is what we normally do, then you just multiply that by six. So it's a 10 second strip along the bottom of the ECG. Uh, so you count the number of beats, multiply it by six, and that will give you beats per minute. So 11 beats in 10 seconds equals um, uh, 11 times six, so 66 beats per minute. I hope that's slightly clearer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrew. I mean, there's, I, there's lots of, there are lots of questions that are unfortunately unanswered. Um, but I'm hoping that we're going to redo one of uh, uh, this web webinar or, or a similar one um, soon, and um, we hopefully will be able to answer uh, questions then. Otherwise, check out Andrew's books, uh, check out our courses. Uh, you should uh, become really, really good uh, with these resources. And uh, I think we'll, we'll need to call it a day. It's already 10 past. 
And uh, I think this was, this was really, really good. We had huge turnout uh, of people, hundreds and hundreds of people have joined. And um, yeah, I thank you, Andrew, so much for your continuous support and, and everything you do. You're an amazing teacher. Thank you, Ed, for co-hosting. Thanks to, to our friends at Med School Coach. And uh, thanks to you guys for watching. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you again soon. Take care. Stay well. You too. My pleasure. Thank you.